Hello, everybody. This is Dan Giles. Welcome to the podcast in today's episode. Visited today by my brother, Doug Giles. He's all the way from New Orleans. What's going on, Doug? Oh, not too much. In town to get married. <clears throat> married? Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. No, I didn't forget. I knew. That's coming up Friday. We're going to be getting the boy hitched. So, what kind of feeling is that? Well, I'm glad you didn't forget. I mean, seeing as how you're standing in the wedding. Yeah, yeah. Well, how's that feeling for you? Mm, feels pretty good. Does it? Yeah, known her for about 30 years now. Actually, on the night, the day we get married, we will have known each other 30 years. Exactly. Well, you finally committed. <laughs> 30 years. You finally I should committed. be committed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go there. I didn't go there. You did. Well, this is the third time, so. Oh, my. Fortunately, not to the same girl. You know, I learned my lesson on the first two. And, yeah. You know. Well, that was the same girl? Uh, no. 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 Okay. Two, two separate. Different. Okay. All yeah, right. Just third, third girl. Third girl. Third yeah. girl. Well, third time's a charm. That's what they say. There so. won't be a fourth. There won't be. Oh, well. Hopefully this one will stick. <laughs> You're throwing it against the wall. If it <laughs> sticks, gonna it's stick. going to be a good deal. <laughs> like spaghetti. Well, you know, I just thought we'd get together and, and have a little time of some chat and see what's going on and find out what's going on, going on in both of our lives, your life, my life as a maintenance supervisor of, of an apartment community. And you... You're in... You got your hands into all kind of things. What, what kind of stuff do you kind of dabble in and to make a living in life oh let's see started off doing pool tables uh 27 years ago uh you know did did pool tables for the longest time and kind of got kind of morphed over into doing now pool post- tables well hang on now pool tables you mean like what kind of moving recovering okay. service work on pool tables so okay. i did i do everything uh, well i have I've done everything from moving and recovering pool tables to full-blown restorations on them. I actually used to work for, for the largest pool table manufacturer in the world as a pool table designer. Yeah. And so you actually designed a, a few pool tables too, mm-hmm. haven't you? I and sure have. Built them from scratch? I sure have. That's pretty cool. Unfortunately, they never did make it to, make it to market. Uh, the company I was working for bought out another company. That was going out of business. So, well, they were they were uh, not really going out of bi- uh, bankruptcy. I couldn't. I had a brain fart this morning. So yeah, it happens to all of us. But yeah, they were going out of business or going through bankruptcy, and the company I was working for actually bought them out. So they ended up with all the pool table designs from the previous company, all of their equipment, all mm-hmm. of the, the employees and everything. So they just didn't have a need for me at that point. Uh, but if that hadn't gone through, then yeah, my pool tables would be all over the country by now. Sweet. That would have been cool. Would have been. Would have been. So pool tables and there's a few other things you're into. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. I do a lot of leather work. Uh, well, the pool table, when I started off doing pool tables, it kind of morphed over into doing uh, upholstery work. And then from upholstery work into doing finish work. And, you know, Dad was a, was a sign painter for yeah. 45, 50 years, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And I learned all about finish work <clears throat> from him, dealing with chemicals and the paints and everything. So it, it, just, it, just, it was kind of a natural flow to move from moving and recovering pool tables to doing restoration work on them. And, you know, again, same thing with Dad. He did a lot of woodworking. And I picked up on all that stuff from him. So, it, like I said, it was just a natural flow to move from moving and recovering pool tables to doing full-blown restorations to, you know, the cabinetry work on them, all that kind of stuff. And then, uh, you know, from from there, that kind of morphed into doing restorations on furniture. And uh, I got together with a business partner that, uh, that used to do pianos, re- refinish pianos. So we refinished, uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many pianos we we refinished in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. Yeah. We actually, we picked up the contract for uh, refinishing all, well, the the Steinway & Sons distributor in New Orleans, we picked up their contract. So if there was a a Steinway & Sons that was going to get refinished through the distributor, it was going to my shop to do it. Mm -hmm. So... 
Lots the of pianos. That's a lot of high gloss. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We, we've some really superior finishes. Yeah, we we we've specialized in high end finish work. Uh, some of the <clears throat> some of the pianos that we worked on were well over two hundred years old. Mm. Um, make them look like brand new again. You yes. know, between our cabinetry work and and the piano technicians work doing the interior of the piano and the the guts of it and the and the keyboard of it and everything, you come out with almost a brand new piano. So you know a piano inside and out, pretty much. That's cool. That's cool. And in the last <clears throat> what five six years, you've gotten into another little venture. Two others. Two others. Well, Two the, others. the main one. Uh, manufacturing and, and sale of sharpening stones for straight razors. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, the other is leather work. I do a lot of, uh, high end leather work as well. Yeah. That's cool. But, uh, you know, it's kind of strange how all of these things kind of morph into each other, you know? Yeah. They're, they're kind of related. And it's, it seems as though our family, we're definitely a service oriented type family. Oh, we're, yeah. We're working with our hands. Absolutely. Every one of us actually. Well, I don't know about our sister, but you know, no, not not so much, not so much her, but uh, all of the rest, all of us boys. Yeah, and there's four of us. Yeah, and out of the four of boys in our family, three of us are actually doing some serious handwork. Yeah, and creativity stuff. Yeah, you know, fixing things, repairing things. It's that's that's pretty wild that we all kind of doing the same thing, mm -hmm. and I think we all learned it from dad, where he was. A jack of all trades and a master of none. He could fix anything. Yeah, you know, and from fixing a lawnmower that we would go out and break. Well, you know? I got to tell you, you had moved out by the by the time that this that this happened. But Dad, I guess I was probably maybe twelve or thirteen years old, maybe a little younger than that. But you had already moved out, and Dad had bought this boat, uh, and and it was this fiberglass boat. And it it just didn't suit him the way that he wanted it to, to be. So mm -hmm. he pulled the thing around into the backyard and he started cutting away on it. And I mean, gutted the thing all the <laughs> way down to the the hull itself. And mom comes out there and she's looking at it. And, and she, you know, she said this for years afterwards. I didn't think I'd, I'd ever see him get that boat back together. <laughs> but he did it. You know, he did yeah. all the fiberglass work, all the, you know, rebuilding the boat. And, and it looked, it looked like a factory made boat. I remember that boat because he had actually built in all these little hidden compartments. Oh yeah. So that when he went out fishing uh -huh. and he caught over his limit, he had a place to hide the extra fish. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I remember all that. They, it's, they would, they would stop <clears> in <throat> some kind of cut back in, uh, in the marshes and, and they would clean the fish and take all the, the, fillets yeah and hide them yeah <laughs> you know it's in case the game warden bags, yeah ziploc bag them pack them up throw a little ice in there and then well, hide we, them in all of his little compartments well dad's gone now so we so we can get away with saying yeah this. yeah that you nobody's going to come back on him now <laughs> yeah, exactly say, you know what mr giles you uh <laughs> we got to take you in buddy your, your son's done squealed on you <laughs> <laughs> the rat patrol has, has showed up <laughs> Yeah, I, I believe that uh, I think I went fishing on that boat with him a couple times, and I remember all those little hidden compartments. There mm -hmm. was a there was a camp that him and his buddies from church from church had. had well, it, it wasn't Dad's camp. No, it was all their camp that a couple of those guys had gotten together on. And I remember us going out to that camp out in the middle of the marsh, mm -hmm. and you know tying the boat up to the dock and sitting out there and filleting fish after fish after fish. Oh, yeah. Fish. Well, that's back before they had limits on fish. Now, listen, you know, I know that it doesn't really sound right, but whatever fish Dad caught, Dad ate. Oh, yeah. You know, that was, if he only got to go fish once, he had enough fish that he would eat for the rest of the year. On. Yeah. So that fish didn't go to waste. Oh, no. And the, and the thing was is that... uh yeah, he did go fishing more often than just once a year. You know, he went fish almost every yeah, almost every Sunday. He'd go <laughs> off fishing, but they would use that fish. I mean, we'd have people coming over to the house. We'd invite people over to the house for fish fries. Uh, we would have. Uh, well, they were big in the church. They always had well, people that's, coming over and, from church. Well, that, but they would also bring the fish for church fish fries as well. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So people were getting fed from Dad's fishing. Yeah, he was one of the. I know we're getting a little off topic from the service side of it, but he was 
probably one of the best fishermen I have ever known. Mm -hmm. That man could go out with six other men and out he'd be the all. only one to catch a fish. Well, you know, you, know? You, you talk about that camp that they had down. In, it was actually in Port Sulphur. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Dad was not one of the... He was not one of the co-owners of the camp, but the reason why he got to use that camp as often as what he did was because every time that they had some kind of work that needed done on that camp. That's true. Dad was down there. He was Johnny on the spot. Yep. Yep. Not only helping them out, but directing them as to what needed to be done yeah, yeah, and he, how to go about doing it. He did a lot of work on that. So he he was sort of like the caretaker. So by rights, he had a... Oh yeah, yeah. Had free use of it yeah. whenever he wanted to. And when we're talking about a man that that, you know, he got his GED. You know, Dad didn't graduate high school. Right. He got his GED, and I he think went, he was probably in his late forties when he got that. And maybe. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, he, he, although he did go to college, his the what he went for was actually sign painting. This right. is back when when you know lettering signs by hand. Mm -hmm. Was the thing to do. This is before computers and yeah, and some final of those letters. signs are still on walls. And oh yeah, signs I see them all the time. And billboards and all over the place where these vinyl signs. And I remember him talking about the the vinyl when it started coming in and mm -hmm. people using vinyl for signs. And he was he just couldn't believe it, right? You know. But uh, yeah, he was definitely a jack of all trades. The man could fix anything, and if he, he could couldn't fix, fix it. He learned exactly how to fix it and fixed it. Or yeah. build it, and most of the time, whatever he built, he overbuilt it. Yeah. 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 You knew that thing 20 years, 30 years, 50 years from now, it's still going to be there. I think that's probably where I got a lot of my, you know, and I stress in all of my YouTube videos, uh, the podcast is new, so a lot of people that might be listening to this show don't haven't really experienced my mentality and my mantra you know, that much, but I do have a YouTube channel as well for fixing things around your house, how to videos. But my credo in doing anything is to do it right and do it right the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't believe I have gotten in trouble at work for not doing a job that when they wanted me to do it, because I want to be sure in my mind that I'm going to do it right mm -hmm. before I'm going to just jump in there and start doing it. So sure. I've always, and they always, the people at work think that I'm procrastinating, but I'm not. I'm actually working out this problem in my head yep. first before I jump in and because I don't want to have to go do it twice. I, I'm a strong believer in, you know, if you don't do it right the first time, when are you going to have time to go back and do exactly. it again? And my motto is do it right, do it right the first time. And if you can't do it right, find out how to do it right and then do it right. Mm -hmm. So you just do it right. Yeah. You know? And, and I put that across. I try to in almost every video that I do, mm -hmm. you know, is to make sure you do that job right. Cause I believe that. And I think I got that from dad mm -hmm. because dad was. Dad was a perfectionist when it came to doing things, but dad also would, uh, I, I really don't understand where he came from where it, he would do a project, but he would always leave something unfinished. Yep. And I have yet to figure that one out. You know, yep. if he was putting crown molding up in his, in his house, there was always one piece of crown molding missing somewhere, but what he put up was beautiful. Yeah. But he would, you know, and I, and I remember mom, she was, she would fuss about that often, you know, because he would do all these projects and everything looked great, but there was always one piece of it unfinished. Well, you know, in, in the house that they had right <clears throat> right before they passed, um, they agreed on every other room in the house except for the kitchen, how the kitchen was supposed to be done. Mm -hmm. So every other room in the house looked fantastic, looked beautiful. Yeah. Except for the kitchen. They couldn't come together on the kitchen. So it never got done. So it never got done. And that was their rule. If we don't agree, we just don't do it. <laughs> that's what they did. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what they did. I remember that because that, that that kitchen had like plywood countertops. It, mm -hmm. I think that house was like an old camp that they bought. I mean, it looked like an old camp. Well, actually, that was a, that was a dairy farm. And the people that lived there had that house... And the shop was actually the dairy barn. Yeah. 
and they would bring the cows in there to milk the cows and everything. But the, but the house, I mean, it, yeah, it was kind of like a shack. Um, and dad turned it into a really beautiful home. Yeah. Everything with the exception in that of the house kitchen. was beautiful when he got done. And as he got older, he got where he couldn't do a lot of stuff anymore. I remember talking to him on the phone and it's like, well, dad, are you going to get out there and do some more work on the house? No, son, I don't think I can. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And it was sad to see that happen, but yeah. And even in that, I remember he laid all the, the ceramic tile throughout the whole house. Deanne did that. Oh, Deanne did that? I Deanne thought Deanne did, did that. Deanne did all the ceramic tile. Okay. Well, it was still an unfinished house. <laughs> it was. It you was. Know, but again, like I said, he, he, everything he did in there that he did finish was beautiful and it was done right. Yeah. You know, and that has been in my mind since I was a kid, you know, to do the job right, mm -hmm. regardless of what it is you're doing. Yeah. You know, so you could be doing your leather work. I could be out there fixing a stove. Shortcuts come back to bite you in the butt. Now there, the business partner that I had when I was when I was doing furniture restoration and doing a piano restoration, he did tell me something one time that that has always stuck with me. You know, you want to do you want to do as good a job as you possibly can on something, mm -hmm. but you reach a point of diminishing returns on some things. Yeah, so. You know, it is entirely possible to do a job and continue to try to perfect it and perfect it and perfect it. But once you reach a certain point, nobody's ever going to appreciate those extra things that you do. And, yeah. it, and it, there is a there is a point where you have to recognize where no matter whatever extra effort that I put in, no one is ever going to appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I have a, I, I have, I'm trying really hard to get that yeah. through to my fiance now with the leather work because now she's starting to do the leather work. And there, are, there are things, you know, she'll have one stitch that's slightly off on a, on, on a project. Yeah. And it's on the inside and, and she's beating herself up over it. And I'm like, look, even if you got, it, if you got it perfect or if you got it slightly off, nobody's ever going to see it. Yeah. It will still be 100% completely functional. The The quality of it is still exactly the same. It's just, you know, sometimes, I guess what I'm saying is sometimes you can end up being your own worst critic. Yeah. And you have to be able to, to step back away from it and say, you know, look at, the, look at the overall big picture and say this is, it's not that it's good enough, it's that, it really is really good. And anything more that you go to do is you're not going to make any extra money off of it. You're not going to save yourself any, any, uh, hassle from returns on an item or anything mm -hmm. like that. You know, it's just stuff that nobody will ever appreciate but you. And, yeah. you know, you can get to a point where that ends up costing you money, especially when you start getting into manufacturing stuff. Yeah. A, l a little bit different subject, but kind of in the same vein, because I don't know if we could call ourselves perfectionist. I'm not a perfectionist by mm -hmm. any means, but, you know, I do believe in doing the job right. And, and you and I have talked about this before when it comes to talking to people about the things we know. Oh yeah, and we're, I know where this we're, is going. <laughs> yeah, we're we're convinced of what we know is the proper right way, and, and and we're so sure of it because we've done it for so long that when we talk to people, we can come across. Now, I don't say it, and, I, and but people have told me, and, and frankly, I don't care. <laughs> you know that I can be an arrogant sob because, mm -hmm. I, and when I'm talking to people about a certain subject. And I, I know that you've gone through this too, mm -hmm. that you come across as arrogant and conceited and talking down talking to people, down to people. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's the big thing for me that I hear. He talked down to me. Yeah. And I hear that too. You know, and, and, and the fact of the matter is we're not talking down to, to, to anybody. Right. We, well, I think you described it when we talked about this the last time, you know. Well, I had said. I had said, you know, imagine for a minute. Now, you know a little bit about physics. I think everybody knows a little bit about physics, how things physically work. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you put a ball on a table, and if the table has a slant to it, the ball's going to roll off. Well, we all know these things, right? Yeah. But imagine for a minute that you go to talk to Albert Einstein about physics. Mm-hmm. He has no clue as to where your knowledge of that subject. Now, this is a subject he's, you know, he's brilliant on. Yeah. But he has absolutely no clue where your knowledge begins and where it ends. Yeah. So the only thing that he can do is start at the beginning and try to get you up to speed to where he is, or at least to a point where y'all can communicate and at least be talking the same language. Yeah. And I find that that's, that that's the, where we, you and I and, and other people that are, that are extremely confident, extremely knowledgeable about the, the subject matter that they're talking about, they get into the exact same trap where, you know, we are extremely knowledgeable about something and we're not, it's not that we're talking down to a customer. We're trying to get you to where to, we're trying to, we're trying to educate you and get you to the point where, where we can at least be talking apples and apples and not apples and oranges. Right. You know, and that can be construed as arrogant talking down. and talking down. Arrogant, and, but, yeah. but you have to realize that that's, if you're a customer, if you're somebody listening to this and, and you're a customer, you have to realize that 99.9% of the time, whoever you're dealing with, if you perceive that's what they're doing, take a step back and just listen to what it is they're saying. Yeah. Leave, leave egos, leave everything out of, out of it and just listen to what it is they're saying. And chances are they're trying to get you on the same page. Yeah. And if that's the case too, it also lets you catch up. Sure. You know, so you're giving them time to, I think that in my case, residents, cause I do apartment maintenance, mm-hmm. you know, and they've done it for 40 plus years. Mm-hmm. So there's almost nothing that I've not seen. Right. You know, so when I go in and a customer wants to try to explain a certain situation, you know, and in my mind, as soon as they started speaking, I've almost figured out what it is. Mm-hmm. And so then I would go into an explanation of it. But I think the best thing to do would probably be to sit back, listen even more mm-hmm. to what they're saying. That way you can catch up to where they are, mm-hmm. even if they are below you in their knowledge and not below you, but in the knowledge they might be. Right. You can then proceed from that, from the ending of what they said and, you know, expound on that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but it's tough with somebody that knows what they're doing and, and is experienced enough to, to, uh, I don't know. Well, what makes know. it, what makes it even, what makes it even more difficult sometimes is the language barrier itself. Okay, and I don't mean somebody one person speaking, uh, speaking one language versus another person. Like I'm speaking English and you're speaking Spanish. That's not what I what I'm getting at. But right. there are there are certain terms that you know once you've been doing a certain job for a long time, you may not interact with the slang terms that some people yeah. use. You know, now I, I mentioned before I've been doing pool tables for a long time. And, you know, it's common slang and, and I understand it when somebody says, Oh man, you know, you got a box of rocks you can bring out with you. Well, mm-hmm. they, they mean a box of balls. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I need to see about getting a rag changed on my table. Well, I know that <laughs> when they say a rag, they really mean, you know, they, they want new cloth. Um, but where, where it really has a problem is when you start using when one person, the layman, starts using terms that actually have real meanings. Like, I'll give you an example. I had one customer a couple of weeks back. She calls me up and she says, yeah, I need to see about getting my pool table leveled and recovered. Well, getting a table leveled, that's a technical term. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's not really all that technical, but it, it, it has a specific meaning in my job. Yeah. Um, Getting a table leveled does not mean getting it reassembled. And getting it reassembled does not mean disassembling. Yeah. So when we, when, You're when talking she, talking down to me, Douglas. Yeah. Well, when she, when she first called me, she says, well, I need to get my table leveled and recovered. So I'd given her a price for that. And then in 
talking with her a bit more on the phone, come to find out, well, no, it's not, you don't need it leveled, you need it reassembled. She had moved from out of state, and the table from the conversation I gathered was disassembled. Well, we give her the price for that, she agrees, we go ahead, we order her cloth, we get out to her house, and then as soon as I look at the table, the table is flipped upside down Mm -hmm. with the slates still attached to it, with the cloth still attached to the slate, upside down on the floor, which that's not the way it's supposed to be moved. Um, so I wonder how they would even move that. Probably on its side, you know. And, and, I, and I've been doing tables for a long time. I've never seen that before. You know, this is the first for me. So I'm, I'm there. I'm a little bit exasperated because she told first she tells me one thing, that she needs a table level. Which doesn't include any kind of assembly. Right, right. So then come to find mm-hmm. out we need it assembled. But no, it's even further than that. We need it disassembled first. Mm-hmm. But in order to do that, I've got to take a chance on damaging her floor, damaging her wall, damaging the table, to, just to get it flipped back right side up so that I can disassemble it, so that I can reassemble it, so that I can level it, <laughs> so that I can recover it, yeah. <laughs> you know. But, and that that's the language barrier, though. I don't know, you know, and, and in all actuality, looking back on it, when she used the term leveling my table, she, in her mind, she may have thought that leveling means yeah. reassembly, you know, but for, uh, for a technician, leveling means one thing and reassembly means another. And that's what I mean by the language barrier. Yeah. And, and that's why sometimes it's very difficult to get the customer and the technician on the same page and without them saying, you're talking down to me. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. That's where it comes in, where when you start to try to correct that language barrier, that's when they right. start getting that feeling of that you're talking down to them and that you're being condescending. And When nothing and could be further from the truth. You're being an arrogant SOB because, right. yeah, that, that's it's definitely an issue. But if anybody out there is listening and you've experienced that, it... I, Trust me, it's not a reflection on you. It's a, re- it's not a reflection on anybody. It's just Human some people nature. know more than other people, and the people that know more than what the other people might know on a particular subject, they're not talking down to you. They're just talking because that's what they know. Right. They're, there's no, there's no animosity and there's no hidden agenda. Right. Most of the time. Right. With people that are that are being that way. So. I would say don't take offense to that if that's what you're feeling. It's, exactly. You just got to realize that these people know what they're talking about. You know, most of these people are, they've been doing this for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And they're so used to doing it that it's, it's, it's almost a, uh, I'm not going to say, it, it's close to being mundane for them. But it's second nature for them done, too. Well, that's probably a better term for yeah. it as, as opposed to say mundane because this is what their career is. That's right. what they've made their life is to go out there and do these things. So hopefully it's not mundane for them. You know, right. It, second nature is a better term. That's for sure. Yeah. So, well, Doug, I appreciate you coming in this week and I, I look forward to Friday when you're getting hitched and married and, Woo-hoo. and <laughs> bringing another Mrs. Giles into the family. We yep. all could use those. Yeah. This family needs some more Mrs. Giles. So, I think we'll go ahead and wrap this up. We've taken these people's time. Well, it's been my pleasure to address your audience and talk with them. And hopefully they've, hopefully I've at least given them something to think about. Yeah. What do you take away from the conversation today? What's the overall theme of what we're trying to convey to people? Personally, I think mine is more of a, you know, I, I'm, I've always said this. I'm always going to say it. If you're going to do something, do your dead level best to do it right. Absolutely. That's don't, don't cut the corners. That's that's one thing I would I would take away from it and the the other thing I would take away from it is try to be mindful of your customer their your customer's shortcomings or your residents or your residents what, kind what of work you exactly because yeah. a lot of this will 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 flip it'll transpose from one job to another anything yeah. in the service industry yeah. doesn't matter what it is. Uh, and try to be mindful of your customer's short custom, your short, their shortcomings and not to, not to be, it, this isn't a, this isn't meant to be arrogant or anything like that, but 
truly their ignorance that they are ignorant of and they don't, they just don't know. And you want to remove that, you want to remove that, uh, that barrier and be mindful of the fact that they don't, they legitimately don't know. Yeah. Let me clarify what you do. that by ignorance, you mean the lack of knowledge, Correct. not stupidity. Correct. The knowledge is there. You just don't want it. Right. right. And, and see, <laughs> no, and, and it's, it, there's nothing negative about being ignorant. I'm ignorant on a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, a whole bunch of things. Um, and, and, and I recognize that I just don't know certain things. Um, and, and that's where you need to, as you have to be able to recognize that within your customer or your, or your tenant and, yeah, you know, try to tiptoe around maybe a little bit more to try well, to avoid I, I those. Think that- that we all should be mindful of other people's feelings and how we come across. It's difficult. It is. It's difficult. But, you know, it, here in, in the last few videos that I've done, the one of the last things I say is to just be kind to each other out there. Mm-hmm. I, I think that that goes a long way. And so if you just try to be kind and understanding of other people, you know, this world would be so much better off. Absolutely. And if you're working on somebody's equipment or whatever it is you're doing for somebody else, just understand that they're not as knowledgeable as you. So be kind and considerate and patient with them. And that's that's really all I can say, you know? Yeah. So guys, this is Dan Giles. I appreciate you listening to today's episode. I look forward to coming back at another event to bring to you And with that, I'll say it again. Be kind to each other out there, and I'll catch you in the next one. So long.